In economics and other social sciences, we often are using observational data to try to trace out causal effects of one variable on another. And the problem of omitted variable bias is a potentially serious problem in which our empirical analysis is going to lead to uh, biased estimates of what a causal relationship might be. To be specific in the regression setting, the OLS, or ordinary least squares regression coefficient on a regressor, will be biased in this case when there's some other variable omitted from the regression that has the following two properties, and both of those are important. First of all, if that omitted variable is correlated with the included regressor, that's the regressor of interest, and, importantly, the omitted variable is itself a determinant of y. We will get omitted variable bias if we have variables for which both things are true. And this relates to common uh, social science concerns over things like correlation versus causation, so-called lurking variables or confounding effects. These really are all omitted variable problems. Under these conditions, one of our key least squares assumptions is violated, namely the independence of the error term from the x's uh, will not hold true, or to put it uh, more concretely in terms of our assumptions, the expected value of the error term for each individual conditional on the x's in the regression will not be equal to zero, and that's the source of the bias as it is in many cases. So to make this a little more concrete, let's look at a couple of examples. Example one is the example that's used in the Stock and Watson textbook repeatedly, and this is the case where we're using data on California school districts to estimate the causal effect of class size on student performance as measured by test scores. So suppose we're using this kind of data cross-section of school districts in California or some other state, and we estimate the following simple regression. That is, the test score is the dependent variable, test score for district I, and it's a linear function of the student-teacher ratio, which is our measure of class size. And we get estimates of the intercept and the slope, and the slope estimate is what we're really interested in. We want to know whether that is negative, as we would expect to be the case if smaller class sizes are associated with better student performance. Is the beta hat that we obtain from this simple regression an unbiased estimate of the causal impact of student-teacher ratio on test scores? And, of course, we can think of lots of reasons why it might not be a good estimate of the causal effect. In particular, this estimate, beta 1 hat for the slope, will suffer from omitted variable bias if there's some other variable or variables that's correlated with class size across the districts and at least partly determines test scores itself. You could think of lots of these, and some of them are discussed in the book, but let's consider a possibility, which is that the average family income in the school district also affects the test score, and we haven't put that in the regression yet. So I'm just going to add the word income here. In our regression, we're looking at the relationship between the student-teacher ratio and the test score, and we're trying to estimate that, and we surmise that it might be negative. We'd like to see if it is. But we know also that there are other things that affect district test scores, and certainly the income, the prosperity of the families in the school district would be one of those. And probably we would think that other things equal income, higher income districts should have higher test scores. There's lots of reasons for that. The parents might be more educated. They might have more resources to devote to their kids uh, in uh, extracurricular activities or getting tutors, etc. So we don't need to come up with a variety of reasons, but we probably think that that's a positive relationship. Now, we can never put every possible variable into a regression, uh, even if we've got lots of data. There's always going to be things that we haven't accounted for. That's the whole idea of the error term, that there are things that we don't include. And that's not a problem. That variable is omitted, but it's only going to cause bias if it has its own effect on the dependent variable y, as does income, we would think. And the second condition is that it's correlated in some way with the variable that we include in the regression. And there's probably good reason to think that would be true in this case as well. So, for example, higher income districts have more tax revenue, 
and they may then have more resources to hire teachers and hence have smaller class sizes. So this relationship we might judge to be perhaps negative. That is, higher income districts have smaller student-teacher ratios. Now, we are trying to get an estimate of this relationship, and um, that is what I'm going to call the direct effect of class size on the test score. So that's the direct effect. But if we've omitted this income variable, the student-teacher ratio may also have an indirect effect on the test score, and that's going to operate through this path here. Uh, so I'm going to call that the indirect effect. Now what's the source of this indirect effect? Well, what's happening is that districts that have larger class sizes, so STR is bigger, are going to be districts that tend to have lower income right because we surmise that is a negative relationship districts that have lower income tend to have lower test scores because income is favorable to higher test scores so what we have here then is that there's going to be an additional sort of confounding effect of class size on test score working by way of the correlation with income and so that indirect effect is negative if we think the direct effect is likely to be negative but also the indirect effect, the confounding effect, is negative. We can't, in the simple regression, disentangle those two things. And hence, if this mechanism is occurring, we expect that the, our estimate beta 1 hat from the simple regression is likely to be biased, and in this case, biased in the negative direction, right? Because it's going to be suggesting a larger effect of small class size on test score than is actually the case from a causal point of view. It may still be the case that smaller class sizes are good for learning, but we're going to get a, an inflated view of that by way of this omitted variable bias. Let's look at another quick example here. So here's a case of um, uh, something that's very interesting in the labor economics literature, which is the causal effect of education on earnings. Now, we have very good uh, economic theories for why we might think that someone who has more schooling is other things equal, likely to make more money, and that's the theory of human capital, for example. So you go to school, you gain skills, and those skills pay off in the job market because of you have higher productivity. So that would be this direct effect here, and we'd like to get an estimate of that because this could tell us a lot that would be of interest from a public policy point of view. What is it worth investing in education just from the point of view of enhancing people's earnings potential? So we'd like to know what's the causal impact of schooling on earnings. And we could run a regression where the dependent variable y is earnings of an individual and the regressor is the years of schooling of that individual. We could see what that slope looks like. However, we know that there could also be omitted variable bias in this case. And there's lots of things that might be correlated both with educational attainment, the years of schooling, and with earnings that p could be confounding effects here. And I'll just name one. You might think native intelligence or some other factors like that, perhaps parental connections. I'm just going to look at one personality trait. I'll call it ambition, drive or ambition. So someone who uh, works hard and is eager to get ahead. Now that kind of person probably is likely to make more money. So it has a direct causal effect on earnings. So that's part one. Part two is it's probably also related to years of schooling. That is someone who is ambitious and hardworking is likely to be more successful in school, other things equal, and to get more uh, education as a consequence. Therefore, the indirect effect working by way of both of those factors is likely to impart a positive bias on our estimate of the direct effect of schooling on earnings. So when we run a simple regression of earnings on education and we get a positive significant coefficient, that may be in part because, of course, the person has gained skills from the schooling, but it may also be that that's the kind of person who would have earned more money anyway regardless of their education. So that's a case of omitted variable bias, in this case in the positive direction. 
All right, let's consider just one more example. You can see how this works. Uh, consider the effect of federal spending in local economies on local economic growth. So we'd like to know whether, for example, if the feds come in and pay for some major, say, construction project related to something or other, building some highways or bridges in a particular region, does that have some kind of local multiplier effect and enhance the growth of the local economy. So we'd like to know what this is. We might think it's positive, uh, potentially, but how big is it? Is it positive and significant? Now, again, we could run a simple regression where we look at across, say, municipalities or states or other local areas and our dependent variable would be the growth rate of the local economy measured in employment or output and the regressor would be the level of federal spending on an annualized basis say in that region or locale. Now we could look at that and uh, the question would be would the coefficient on the spending variable federal spending be a reliable indicator of the causal multiplier impact of spending on growth and we could think of again of lots of potential omitted variables that might confound that conclusion. Here's one. Local economic conditions that arise from other factors are likely to be of course correlated with growth. Needless to say if the local economy is booming due to some industry that's been very successful or for some other reason that's likely to enhance the growth. Now what's the relationship between the local economic conditions and federal spending and that's actually um, a, a tricky uh, business but we might imagine that the federal government could come in and spend in areas that were economically depressed or had, were going through uh, local business cycle conditions that put them at a disadvantage if that were the case then we would find that the federal spending is endogenous in the sense that the government's spending more money in places that are more depressed and that would be a negative relationship as I indicate there. If that were the case we have a negative indirect effect. The government is spending money in places that happen to have weaker local economies for, for a variety of reasons and those economies then show less economic growth. Does that mean that the government spending is depressing local growth? Not necessarily. It may be responding to bad conditions that arise for other reasons. So there's our indirect effect and in this case under this conjecture the indirect effect is negative and that's going to tend to create a bias. So even if this direct effect were positive the indirect effect might offset it and in essence mask the effect of federal spending on local economic growth. Another case of omitted variable bias and in this case one that would uh, lead the bias in the direction of zero effect. Now I just want to finish by reiterating with this example what are the key components of having omitted variable bias and that is again that the omitted variable has to of course have some impact positive or negative on the dependent variable so that's that link there in addition the omitted variable has to be correlated in some way with the included variable leaving out a variable that's not correlated with the included variable it would be nice to have controlled for that effect but it's not going to lead to omitted variable bias with both those things present however we have potential for omitted variable bias and then we cannot draw valid causal conclusions from our simple regression.